Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. How are you doing? Are you guys happy to be here? So uh, we have some very special guests to my right. This is One Common from Nashville, Tennessee. They're gonna be worshiping with us. Hey, if you guys know these songs, sing along. Here we go. Yeah. I'll praise in the valley. And I'll praise on the mountain. Mm -hmm. I'll praise when I'm sure. And praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. And I'll praise when surrounded. Oh, cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. Everybody now, here we go. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, to praise. Praise is a weapon, and it's more than a sound. Oh, my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. Here we go. Yeah. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. Praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, I'll praise cause you're true. I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, I'll praise cause you're true. Come on. I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you who praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive, so how could I keep it? My God is alive, so how could I keep it inside? So praise the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Sing it up. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, we sing it all, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me, we sing it all, oh, Christ be magnified. be magnified in me. We sing it all. Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. 
Amen. Amen. God is good. Welcome to church. You can take a seat for a second. Hey, Metro family. We have been talking about being a better church, better people, better followers of Christ, better moms and dads, better single people, better married people, better kids. Uh, you know, we've been just talking about how better begins with God. And, and we really do believe that our church is meant to make the world better. Our church is designed to help people take their next steps with God, to, to find God. For some people, it's just a very beginning step. And for other people, it's, you know, how do we move further and deeper into our relationship with Jesus? And how, how do we get our families to move in, in one direction? And, and so we've been trying to get around this idea that better begins with God. And part of the better uh, series has been the better campaign. Uh, we've come to a point in our church where things are rocking and rolling, uh, things are growing, we got lots of people coming. And so we need to do some things in our building and around our property uh, to make church better, to make it more accessible to people. And, and so we've been talking about how we want to put a small addition on the back, we want to do a bunch of parking stuff, and you know, and, and a lot of that just takes big money. And so uh, we, we launched this campaign called the Better Church Campaign. And we've been asking for you to pray and to commit uh, to being on the team, to being in the game, uh, to make a difference. And so uh, we've heard some really good feedback from a whole bunch of people, which is awesome. And it seems like we're kind of all on the same page, realizing that it would be nice to get some you know, steps forward as a church. Uh, but we need you to really uh, come to the point of commitment. We need you to decide to get into the game. Uh, there have been a bunch of you who have done this already, but but not nearly enough. And so I just want to remind you of a, of a couple things that we're hoping for and praying for and really wanting you to, to respond to. And uh, the first is this, is that really we just want to hear if you have a commitment to this. It could be, you know, even as little as $500 or it could be as, as much as you want, but we really just want to know if you're willing to make a commitment because Jesus taught us, of course, uh, to count the cost before we do anything. And, and we would not be good stewards of this church. We would not be good leaders if we just started building and hope that the money comes in. But we, we need to make sure that we plan well so we don't fail big. Plan well so we don't fail big. And so uh, we put together on the church app, if you were to go to the church app, Metro City Church app, you can get it on the uh, app store or anywhere you get to download apps for your phone. And uh, just click on there and you'll see a Better Church Campaign tab. Click on there and it'll take you to a form where you can just make a commitment to let us know that you're, you're planning on giving above and beyond what you normally give to the church, uh, that you're planning on making a commitment to this Better Church campaign. Uh, there's also, right there at the exact same spot, 
there's a way that you can give now. So if you're ready to give now, it'll you just follow the directions. It's very, very clear. Um, but our hope is, is that you will make a commitment so that we can count the cost. Or if you're ready to make a, a gift above and beyond your normal giving, that you could do that soon. Uh, that would be cool. And it's all available to you through the app or through the website. There's a, the, there's a Better Church campaign tab. Just follow the prompts there and it will lead you uh, what to do. Also, I want to let you know this, that our hope is, is that all of the commitments would be uh, made soon, like within the next, let's say, month or so, uh, but we want to give our giving by the end of September. We want to be done with our gifts. So as you plan financially, think in terms of what can you plan to give before September 31st. We don't want to do one of these dragging on for two years. We don't want to, you know, squeeze everybody hard. We don't want to do any of that. We just simply want to lay the need out in front of you and ask you to ask God what you might do. We really do believe that God has big plans for our church, uh, that God is using our church in your life and in the life of your family and, and people in our community. We really do believe that God is doing great things here and we want to build a better church together. What is going on, Metro? How are we doing? How are you doing? Awesome, 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 man. Uh, I want to say first and foremost, welcome. I know you guys didn't wake up early. Everybody awake today? Awesome. My name is Pastor Josh. I'm the Generations Pastor. And man, we have a lot going on uh, in the life of our church, the Better Church campaign, obviously. Uh, but we have something coming up called Revive Week. Everyone say Revive Week. And man, let me tell you something. So we do it different around here. So Revive Week actually starts this Friday uh, for Good Friday services. We're going to do it Friday night. We're going to have an amazing experience. Uh, and you're all invited. Bring your family, bring your friends. And then two days later on Sunday is what? Easter, right? So we're going to have our Easter experiences it's going to be so awesome, but then we do something a little old school, and I don't know if anybody knows about this. I heard about it for the first time because I'm still super young. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Calm down. Um, but we do an old school revival. We have a pastor coming in from Forge Ministries. He's going to be phenomenal, and let me tell you, if you have friends or family who are on the edge of coming to church that you almost got in the door, bring them to this. I promise you, you will not regret it. It's going to be three days long. I know it's like, oh man, three days. I already do Sunday. Listen, three days long, it's worth it. It's gonna be fun. Invite your family. It'll be good for your soul. We're a next step church and everybody, whether they're in unbelief or belief, has a next step with God. Amen? Amen. Speaking of next steps, uh, we do these things called city groups. Anybody in my city group in here? You better yell. Yeah, let's go. It's like four of them. Um, but listen, we do city groups where we just get together in community. We love each other. And we, and we like pray for each other. It's like one of the best times of the week. And right now we are looking for leaders. So if you think, man, uh, I think maybe I could do this. I could open my home. Uh, I, I have an interest in this. Uh, scan this code right here and it'll take you to a, a form. You can fill it out. It's just interest. You're not signing in blood. You're not doing any of that. You're just saying, hey, this might be a next step for me and I wanna take it. I wanna see what it looks like to take it. Amen? Let's go. Uh, and then the last thing, it wouldn't be, uh, or I wouldn't be, the generations pastor if I didn't do like a shameless plug. So if you're 18 to 26 years old, we have an amazing ministry for you. Uh, it's called Metro Young Adults. We do it Sunday nights right here in this building. And I'm telling you, man, something special is happening in the young adults of Down River. We are trying to go after them. Uh, we want them to know Jesus. And there is such a great community being built. And you are invited. If you are 18 to 26, we are inviting you to Metro Young Adults tonight uh, at 8.30. Doors open at 7.45. We're gonna have a blast. Show up. I promise you, it'll be worth it. It will be worth it. And then the last thing I have is giving. And uh, obviously, if you're first time, I just wanna say welcome, and this isn't necessarily for you. If you wanna give, you can. But those of us uh, who call Metro home, uh, I just wanna remind us, man, we are not giving to Metro. We are giving through Metro. We go to Kenya because of giving. Uh, we have VBS because of giving, retreats because of giving. Your giving goes further than this building. And I just wanna remind us all of that as we go back into a time of worship. So if you guys wanna stand up, uh, we're gonna go back into a time. The band's gonna lead us in. And I promise you, uh, these guys... Zach and Maddie are doing a phenomenal job, man. Uh, it's going to be good. I love you guys. I'll see you later. Come on. 
One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but submit to him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Um, And I think the key word there is all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Submit to him in all your ways. A lot of times we give God a piece of us, but we don't give him all of us. So this is just our reminder during this time to say, we surrender, Lord. We give you everything. So let's sing.
see so I could walk right through it My fears are drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and say I am a child of God
salvation Jesus we take a moment as simply your people to worship you to thank you and to tell you just how good you are I can't even think of words that describe what you what you mean to me personally. So Jesus, we just worship you. We say thank you. We say that we love you. We wanna see your kingdom come, not only in this world, but in our lives. God, would you do a work inside of each of us today, God. Help us to know you better because we are here. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <laughs> Woo! Having some church today. Anybody glad to be in church? You know, uh, there's not a lot that wants to build your soul, amen? But this is one place that we can gather together uh, purposely, get our minds, our hearts around eternal things, and God does something different when we're together, amen? And if you're joining us online, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Metro, would you welcome our friends online? Yeah, we are so glad that you're here. 
You know, uh, did, did you guys hear about the, the wife uh, that went with her neighbor, her neighbor friend, to the police to report her, that her husband was missing? Anybody? This is a very big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, she goes to the, you know, the police station and says, my husband's come up missing, haven't seen him. And, and of course, the officer says, well, can you give us a description? And uh, so she says, you know, oh, yeah, for sure. He's 35 years old. Uh, he's six foot four, very athletic build, about 185, 190 pounds, ripped muscle. Uh, very well-spoken, very soft-spoken, very gentle. Um, you know, dresses really nice, drives a Mercedes, and he's excellent with the kids, just excellent with the kids. And the officer's writing all this down, and the neighbor lady goes, what, what are you talking about? Your husband is five foot four, bald, chunky, fat, foul mouth, poor, broke, drives an old pickup truck, and he's terrible with your kids. And she goes, of course. Why would I want him back? I want somebody else. <laughs> Sometimes we want better. Amen? And it's okay to want better. Anybody want better? Uh, but ladies, don't turn in your husband for better. How about men in the room? How about you work on being better? Amen? Ladies, amen? Yeah, men, come on. Well, we are in our series called Better, and uh, we've been getting around the idea that better begins with, help me out. Better begins with who? God. We've been saying like this, I, I, I just believe this, listen, friends, that in any area of your life, I don't care if it's your finances, your relationships, your friendships, your employment world, uh, your finances, your, your health, whatever it is, uh, your marriage, your kids. If, if you figure out somehow to get God into the middle of that mix, it will get better in every area of your life. Anybody starting to believe that at all? Yeah. yeah? So I, I think this has been a really good series so far where we've talked about some very important things. Like, like, do you guys remember how we talked about how we have to think better if we want better? We have to choose better if we want better. We, we, have to, we have to have a new perspective, a better perspective. We have to have a better attitude. We talked about all this. We talked about having better discipline in our life, amen? If we want different, we're gonna have to have a different discipline in our life to get there. Uh, we, we, we spent a couple weeks now talking about better family, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, when, when we got into the better family week, I thought you know we'd spend about a week on that and we'd move on to the next subject, but... Um, I don't say this very often, but I felt just such a heavy hand from, from God saying, we need to camp out here for a couple of weeks uh, because I think every single one of us wants better, needs better in, in our home. Even if your home's doing well, you, you, you still want it to be better. Others of us who say, my home isn't so good and, and I need it to be better, but we all want better family, amen? Uh, we, we just do. Uh, the, the truth is, is that, that there is nothing uh, in, in the world that can bring us joy like family brings us. True? While at the very same time, there's nothing in the world that can bring heartache like family brings us. Disappointment like, like family brings us. Uh, and, and the truth is, is that sometimes we get a little joy and sometimes we get a little heartbreak. And, and so I think it's important to talk about this. And so the first week, when we gathered around this idea of family, we, we talked about this idea that if you want your family life to be better, then somehow, in some way, you gotta get God into it because better begins with God. That We said it this way, that you have to love God. If, you want, if, any, if you're any part of a family and you want that family to get better, that you have to figure out how to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. Listen, our kids, we said it this way, that our kids don't expect us to be perfect. I don't think our parents expect us to be uh, perfect. I don't even think our spouses or our significant others expect us to be perfect. But they do expect us to be real, amen? They expect us to, that our love for God be authentic and not full of hypocrisy. And so we said it starts with loving God. And then we said in week two that you have to lead your family intentionally, even if you're the kid, you have to lead into your family intentionally. But parents, it is your job to lead your family counterculturally. There's nothing in this world that wants your family to get better. Nothing. You have to do this on purpose. You have to figure out who you want to become and then live and lead your family in that direction. Amen? Is anybody with me so far? Yeah? So what I want to do today is I want to go a little bit further. Because the truth is, um, we're going to talk about something that's a little bit hard to talk about. Um, you know, you look at some people, and you look at some families, 
sometimes some marriages, sometimes relationship with parents to kids, kids with parents. And you look at it and they go, you just go, man, they just got it together. And then you look at your own life and you go, behind closed doors, it's not that. Um, For many in this room, uh, a broken family is the deepest heartache in your life. Family for you hasn't turned out what you hoped it would be. It, It just has gone sideways in your life. And in a lot of ways, you know, some, some in this room, you're on your second, your third, maybe your fourth marriage, and you have all these blended family situations, and it's just become extremely difficult to navigate it all. But you want it to be better. And so I thought what we would do today is we would spend some time talking about a, a very important subject matter, how to make families better even when they're kind of broken, even when they're hurting. Would that be something that we're talking about? Okay. And so uh, I don't pretend to be able to um, say anything that would fix anything. But my hope is, is that we can at least get us pointed in the right direction, all right? And so my plan is this. I, I want to, uh, this may sound a little boring at first, but I want to share some, uh, some, some statistics and some commentary surrounding family life, what's going on in our culture and what, what people are figuring out. And then, if it's okay with you, I want to take us deeply into two different passages of Scripture. Would that be cool? Can we do this? And, and so, I want to start off with this. Is, uh, I did a little statistical uh, study and uh, came up with some, wow, just some incredible stuff. Like, um, if, you, if you were to do any studying on the subject of family, you would, you would have to agree, after reading and studying this issue, you'd, you would come away understanding in total agreement that that the better the family life is, the better opportunity is for everybody in the family. Better success comes to the family, every, uh, every member of the family. The better family life gets, the further people can go in, in this world. That's just what the statistics prove. If you're having difficulty, for example, uh, loving in your family, getting along in your family, uh, study after study shows that that bleeds into every area of your life in a negative way. Uh, it affects your career, it affects your earnings, it affects your overall well-being and happiness. It, it's, it's just true. It's just true. And, and so I think this is worth talking about a little bit. For, for example, listen, uh, U.S. News and World Report, they commissioned a study of millionaires in America, and they concluded this. Listen, their, their conclusion, I'm just quoting it. It says this, quote, a picture of the typical millionaire is an individual who has worked eight to 10 hours a day for 30 years or so and is married to his or her high school or college sweetheart. Millionaires, this is them saying, they tended to be married once and they stayed committed to that marriage and family, end quote. Uh, a New York executive firm did a research project uh, researching over 1,365 either vice presidents or presidents of major U.S. Uh, corporations. And, and their finding was shocking to me. Just remark- I guess it didn't shock me personally, but it shocks the world. Here's what they found. Uh, quote, that 87% of either vice presidents or presidents within the U.S. corporate structure, 87% of them were still married to their one and only spouse. 87%. Listen to this. This is really something. 92% of those presidents and vice presidents of major U.S. corporations were raised in a two-parent household with their mom and their dad. That, that's big. It, it's kind of undeniable, the correlation, yes? Okay, so listen to this. At the same time, any study that you look into, anyone, they all reveal the same thing. When you study wealth, income, success in America, uh, uh, satisfaction with life, All the the single biggest indicator of everything that is negative is single parenthood. If if you look at, listen, listen, listen. I'm I'm not trying to beat up anybody, but just hear me out. If you look at poverty rates, drug rates, criminal rates, jail time rates, low educational achievement, the single biggest indicator of every single one of them boils down to one simple factor. Single family, raising children in a single parent household. And in particular, listen to me, dads, men, the single biggest, the greatest indicator of that is when the dad is absent from the child's life, period. Now, listen, I don't say any of this to beat up anybody, to make anybody feel bad, but but this is real. 
and it needs to be talked about. And we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it, even though nobody else in America wants to talk about it. We should talk about real things. Amen? <laughs> and, and so my hope is, is that if we can figure out how to strengthen our family foundations, we, we can move all of us forward in life a little bit. And, and so I just want to encourage you um, th like this, that better family equals a better life. It, it really is kind of that simple. If we can somehow figure this out, I'm just saying that family matters. A better family matters. And I'm thinking if we can figure this out in society that, that we can have better lives together, our world would be better. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah? Now listen, please, nobody get hurt. Nobody get offended by any of this. We, we need to be challenged and encouraged to move no matter where we are right at this very moment. We need to move in the right direction. I, I found a really interesting study done by the University of uh, Nebraska, their human development department. Uh, they, they, they got together 500 uh, counselors, therapists, and psychologists and psychiatrists, and, and they, they did a study trying to figure out what were the dominant traits inside of families that they deem successful because all these people work with so much brokenness, they go, okay, let's flip the coin a little bit. What is working well in families that elevate certain families above the rest? What, what, is, what are the key mechanisms? Uh, and, and I thought they were incredible. You wanna hear some? I, I think this is just fascinating to me. Uh, they said this, and, and I'm quoting, uh, strong families, quote, communicate well with one another. And I thought, no duh. They, they just talk well with one another, but they go on to say they don't yell at each other, they don't cuss at each other. Uh, they don't, listen to this, this, they don't belittle one another. Pause real quick, yeah. I, some, some of our families, we've made an art form of being sarcastic toward our spouses, our children, our parents. Is it, it, seriously, is it really that hard to not belittle one another? Would it be better if you were in a family that made it a habit of somehow being positive toward one another? Yeah, I, th I think it would be better for all of us, right? Uh, here's the second thing. I, I found this really interesting. They said strong families, quote, purposely support and respect one another. Simply, they prioritize family time. They just make it a priority in their family to do things together, to show up for one another. One of the bylines was that they care about one another's successes and failures and efforts in life. In other words, if your sister's having a volleyball game, every once in a while you show up to her volleyball game. You want a better family? Invest some time in your family. Make sense? Yes? Uh, here, here's another one. They said strong families build trust through spending time with one another, and here it is, and they share responsibilities. In other words, uh, mom doesn't do everything, dad doesn't do everything, that everybody does something in the family. They, they, they figure out how to pool the effort to realize that our family rises and falls on togetherness. They, they share that responsibility. They invest into their homes. In other words, listen to me, uh, mom comes in and says, hey, we need to get this cleaned up. And that does not mean me. It means we. We means we. We need to work on this. And the more we seem to invest into one another in the efforts to move each other forward, we all move forward together. It sort of just makes sense, doesn't it? Yes? Uh, listen to this one. This one was actually kind of startling. Remember, this isn't a Christian survey at all, okay? This has nothing to do with Christianity. But they found this, quote, strong families develop a strong sense of right and wrong, what is acceptable and what is not inside of this family. So in other words, uh, they, they look at families that are doing well and they literally say, um, parents figure out what's a yes and what's a no and they stick with it. They literally say, hey, we know you're 14 now and you think you rule the world, but you don't. It's, it's literally that simple, that, that you're 18, but you're still at home. You're 20 and you're still at home. We don't act like this in our home. We, we have this set of shared values. We have this set of shared responsibilities. We have this shared set of expectations. Does that make sense? Now, pause. If we shared those kinds of responsibilities and expectations and values, do you think family life would be easier? Yeah. Come on, do you? Of course. Of course it would be. It would be better in every single way. Now listen to this. This one uh, was probably the most shocking. Uh, remember, this isn't a Christian survey at all. But listen to this final quote. It says this. The strongest families, the strongest families, and this is a quote, they share a religious core. Now they didn't identify what that religious core looked like, but I'm guessing it was America, probably predominantly it was Christian. Uh, but, but they figured out that when God is in the mix, 
better begins with? They said the strongest of all families have God somewhere in the mix of that family. So do you think it's probably important to put God somewhere in the mix of your family? I think so. I really do. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm really just trying to encourage you, is that family really does matter. Family, better family, equals a better life. And so here's what I want to do is that I want to read. Actually, I want to pray first, and then I'm going to just jump into some very important I think teaching from scripture that I think we, we can grow from. So let's just pray for a minute that God would speak to us and let us be open about some of the hurts and pains that are in our own families. Okay, can we do this? All right, so Father in heaven, uh, we just take a moment to quiet ourselves to hear from you. God, I think every single person in this room, no exception, would say we want better family, even if our family's pretty good. Uh, we have a lot of hurts, we have a lot of pains a lot of disappointments, a lot of regrets. And I pray, God, even right now that maybe they would start to heal and that your spirit would visit with us and would move us forward, move our families forward. In Jesus' name, together we say, come on, amen, amen. I wanna read God's word to you. Is that good? Okay, Uh, we're gonna go to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Uh, Now, when you think of Nehemiah, you don't think of it as a family book at all. Nehemiah was a uh, leader in the Old Testament part of the Bible. Uh, He was, uh, you can think of him like a governor over the people of Israel. Uh, You can think of him as part politician, uh, part warrior, and part religious leader. He was kind of all these things together. He was like essentially the governor uh, over Israel at this time. Now I need to bring you up to speed very quickly on what was happening in the people of Israel. So three names that you'll probably recognize. There were the Babylonians that came along and they destroyed Israel, like crushed them. And and then the Assyrians eventually beat the Babylonians and they re-crushed Israel even further and took them into slavery. And then the Persians beat the Assyrians and they kind of finished off the deal and they brought Israel to their lowest point. Now what's interesting is the uh, Persian, does anybody remember those names from high school? Yes? Our tax dollars at work. Right there, okay. So uh, what's interesting is the Persians dealt with slavery different. Out of all the empires of the world, they decided that it was better to send people back into their homeland so they could tax them. So they could have freedom to develop family and prosperity, but we can tax them that way. So they did something crazy. They released the people of Israel to go back to Jerusalem to start to rebuild their their towns, their their cities, and particularly the walls of Jerusalem. So are we all up on the same page? And Nehemiah was the leader that was doing this. Now, what's interesting, when we read this, I I want a point of theological clarity. Now listen, we're gonna read a section from Nehemiah chapter four, and it has nothing, it's, it's really about, listen, it's about rebuilding a nation, it's about rebuilding a city, it's about rebuilding a people group but it doesn't directly mention any particular family. But what we're gonna see is that it takes strong families, listen, to build a community, to build a city, to build a nation, amen? Has anybody noticed that in our country, in our nation, that as the family falls apart, cities fall apart, neighborhoods fall apart, and the country falls apart. And so just for a point of theological clarity, Uh, we're gonna grab some principles around what Nehemiah was doing, rebuilding the nation of Israel. You ready for this? Okay, here it is. Nehemiah, um, chapter chapter four, we're gonna start in verse one. Uh, Pause for a moment before we even even get there. Uh, Have you ever noticed in life that when you you try to do something good, it's better than you think? Anybody? Anybody? Like you decide to improve something, make something better, and it's like one thing after another comes against you. Or is it just me? Like you, you feel this in life, like you decide to move forward in an area of life, and it just seems like there's one enemy attack after another enemy attack. Is it just me, or do you feel this? You know, I, I can tell you, like in my life, I feel this all the time. Like uh, it, it's true. I felt it in my own family. Like you try to move your family forward, it's like boom, something comes against you. You try to move your health forward, boom, something comes against you. Try to move your finances come forward. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like. I thought I was going forward, but I just ended up three steps back. And listen, I have felt this in every area of my life. I have felt this in this church, trying to do something good in this church. It's like two steps forward, three steps back. All the time. It just seems like there's one thing after another thing, one fight 
after another thing. It seems to me like when you do anything good, you're in for a fight. True? True in the back? Yep. So I'm going to read from Nehemiah as they rebuild their nation. Here it is, verse 1. When Sanballat, that's the, the guy, okay, Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Uh, so who was Sanballat? Sanballat was like a local warlord who filled the power vacuum when Israel was removed from the regions of Israel, the nation the city parts of Israel, when they were removed, there was this power vacuum. So a local warlord named Sansbullet, he rises up. You see how that works? When, when, there's, when there's a power void, he rises up and he begins his own little kingdom under the Persians. And now all of a sudden he's angry because Persia has released the Jews to come back and claim their homeland again. Does that make sense? And so he's angry about it. So verse two, it says, he ridiculed the, Jew, the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the armies of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they, will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life that, from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And so he's like mocking them, right? He's making fun of them. Uh, pause again, real quick. Have you ever tried to do something good in your life and had an enemy come against you. Come on. And sometimes that enemy's a person. Sometimes that enemy's a thing. Sometimes that enemy's a situation. Sometimes that enemy uh, is, is an issue in your life. But you have tried to do something good to rebuild something in your life, to change direction in your life. And it's hard, isn't it? It's a lot harder than you think. Because listen, good never means easy. Amen? It doesn't. Uh, there, th this is the principle, right? Uh, you, you try to turn around your health, it's not easy. You try to turn around your finances, it's not easy. You try to turn around your anxiety, it's not easy. There's always an enemy. There's always attack in your life. There's always something coming up against you. Always, it never stops. It will not come easy, amen? amen. So good is never easy, but let me tell you something. God's best for you is best for you even though it may not seem like it's best for you because it's so hard. What? God's best for you is best for you even though it doesn't seem best for you because it's so hard. Be ready for it. Here's the next part. This is so funny. Verse three, it says, Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, so he's the sidekick of Sambalot, says, what are they building? What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. In other words, these people don't even know what they're doing. They're terrible. They don't, they're, they're, their wall is so bad. If a fox gets up there, that thing's going to crumble. It's not going to stop us. It's not going to stop an army. We're going to crush them. No matter what they do, they mock them. You see this in here? And so here's the principle. You may want to write this down. Good is never easy. Good always has a naysayer in your life. Good, good in your life will not go unopposed. People will tell you that your family is a wreck. People will tell you that you're not gonna fix this marriage. You're not gonna uh, fix your kid. You're not gonna go anywhere in your life. Your finances, you've made too many stupid decisions. You're never gonna rise. You're never gonna make anything better. It's, you always will have people coming against you, amen? It, it takes work to build something better. It takes effort to build something better. And not just a better family, but a better life, Amen? And so, and so look at this, listen. Uh, good is never easy, but listen to this, verse four. We're gonna see another principle at work. This is how Nehemiah responds. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder to the land of captivity, uh, in the land of captivity. Uh, do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from, from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. What did they do, friends? They turn to God. Because why? Better begins with God. And here's the principle. I want you to write this down. I want you to think deeply about this. If you want something better in your family, better in your life, write this down. Turn to God and ask him directly about what is hard in your family. You ask God directly about the things that are hard in your family, hard in your life. Don't go praying like childish little prayers. Oh, God. Be nice to my husband. He needs a nice day. No. You pray against what is against your family. Come on. You hear me? You pray against what is coming against your husband. You pray against what is coming against your child. You pray against what is coming against your parents. You pray against what, what is coming against your wife. You pray against the schemes of the enemy in your life. Amen? 
You, do you hear what I'm saying? Because listen, is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Because listen, your battle is not a battle just against flesh and bone. Your battle is a spiritual battle waged in, in, in areas of life that are unseen. Jesus says it like this. He says, your enemy, and you do have an enemy. Your family has an enemy. The whole world does not care about your family. It says the enemy of God comes to steal, kill, and destroy all that is good and all that is holy in your life. He wants nothing better than to take everything that God is trying to do and, and throw it into the garbage. To throw you into the garbage. Listen, God, uh, the, the, the enemy of God wants your kid addicted. The enemy of, of God wants your kid unsure about their life. The, the enemy of God wants you to have doubts about your husband, about your wife, about your significant other. Uh, the, the, the enemy of God wants to destroy everything that is good, always causing doubt about God's goodness in your life. And you need to pray big prayers about it. You need to say, uh, you need to say God, I, I pray against this. Listen, because we say this around here all the time. When man works, man works. But when man prays, God works. And there's a big difference between what I can do and what God can do. We need to go to God. Because better begins with God. Look at this, verse six. This is amazing. So we rebuilt the wall till it reached half of its height for the people worked with all of their heart. Uh, and here's another principle. If you want to rebuild something great in your life, you have to be all in. If you want anything to be great in your life, I mean, literally in any area of your life, it, it, it's not a half-hearted effort. It's an all-in kind of an effort, right? You're, listen to me. My spouse needs to know that I am all in committed to her all the time, without exception, no matter what. Her and her alone, I'm committed. And, and I need to know that from her. My kids need to know that I'm willing to sacrifice for them because I'm committed to them until the day I stop breathing. That's what they need to know. And listen, you need to know that. And your parents need to know it from you. Your siblings need to know it. If you want something better, it's an all-in kind of a deal. It takes full commitment to do anything good in this life. Amen? Verse seven, listen to this. But when Sambalit, Tobiah, and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that they, the repairs to the walls of Jerusalem had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they became very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Uh, again, have you ever thought the harder I try, the harder it is? Like you're starting to close the gap. You're starting to make progress. And now this happens. Don't tell me you haven't felt this way. Everybody feels this way. You feel like, man, I'm making progress. And oh, I was just starting to jog. I, I got up to a quarter mile and I twisted my ankle. Right? I mean, it's just life. You try hard, something hard comes against you. But look what Nehemiah does. Look at the response. But we prayed to our God. Why did they pray to God? Because better begins with God. But there's something more they did. And they posted a guard both day and night to meet this threat. And so they were making progress. The enemy turns up the heat a little bit. You're turning up the heat. They turn up the heat. You're turning up the heat. They turn up the heat. Things are getting more and more intense. And then they go, we got to strategize. We got to make a plan. So they start posting guards. You see this in there? He turns to God, to God. Listen, he turns to God first because better begins with God. Pause real quick. Pause real quick. Look at me real quick. Have you ever prayed about something? Yes or no? Have you prayed about something twice? The same something. Have you ever prayed a hundred times for the same thing? I have. I can tell you this right now. I will pray for my kids and my grandkids every day until the day I die. Period. <laughs> Period. Because I need to keep going back to God. But then there's, a, then there's another step. Nehemiah takes. He, he says he posts guards day and night to meet this threat. So what does he do? He strategizes. He thinks, right? You want better? This is the principle. You want better? You have to plan for better. If you don't plan for better, you plan to fail. It's that simple. If you want to move forward in any area, you got to plan to move forward. You got to strategize. You got to think about it. You got to do something different. Think about your family. Here's the truth about families. Every single family, every single relationship gets into ruts. She says this, I do that. She does this, I do that. I do this, she does that. My kids do this because I always do this. This will really egg on my mom, so I'll just kick her like a little. It won't be too obvious, but I'll just nudge her along, you know, in my own way that's a dirty little, mm, right? We get into these ruts. 
But if you want your family to be different, guess what you have to do? Different. If you want your family to be different, come on, you have to do different. If you want your health to be different, guess what? You're gonna have to do something different. If you want your finances to be different, you're gonna have to do something. But the problem is with humanity, you and me, we're creatures of habit. Listen to me. We are creatures of habit. You have to think, you have to plan, you have to strategize for something better. You literally have to get it down, you have to think about a plan and make it better, amen? So Nehemiah sees his plan, he sees that they're smart, he's like, oh, these guys are good, but I'm better. He goes, these guys are tough, but I'm tougher. These guys are shrewd, but I'm shrewder, right? And let, let, look at me real quick, people of God, any Jesus people in the house? Any, any Jesus people in the house? You're good, and you're better than the world because you're, listen, because you're led by the Spirit of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? You're led by the Spirit of God. You don't lie over and play dead. You make a plan for better and let God's Spirit lead you. Come on, anybody hear me? So, verse 10, this is starting to get good. Listen to this, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah, that's the Israelites, uh, said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. In other words, it's hard, it's overwhelming. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the walls. They were like, we can't do this anymore. Pause real quick. Have you ever decided to do something good? It becomes so hard and you go, I don't think it's worth it anymore. Yes? And then what happens? You have this big dream and then you start pulling back from this dream. You have this big vision, you start pulling back from this vision. You know what God's calling you to do, so you, one step at a time, you fall short of it and eventually you just say, it's too hard. It's too hard. So the people are going, it's too hard. And then also the people were saying, listen, they were repeating what their enemies were saying. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. In other words, they were sending in spies. They were sending in terrorists to work from the inside, in the inside of the walls. And so they don't even know who their friends are at this point. They don't even know who's with them and who's against them at this point. And, and they had to get tough about this. You, you see this? This is good, isn't it? They should make a movie about this. This is intense. Then verse 12, it says, then the Jews who lived near them from the outside of the city, they came and told us, hey, um, they told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack you. In other words, we're seeing it. Every time we do this, they do that. Every time we move over here, they move over here. It's like, they're, they're on us constantly. We're, we're, we, this, this fight is just never, ever ending. You ever feel that way? This fight is never, ever ending. Uh, they should make a movie about this. I'm telling you, listen, it's so good. Uh, it, it seems like everything the people of God tried to do, the enemy was there st uh, every step along the way fighting them. They had every reason to quit, every reason to surrender, every reason just to give up. You see that in the text? They had every reason to give up. But here's what Nehemiah does. You ready for this? Say ready. This is so good. Therefore, I stationed some, uh, some of the people behind the lowest points, the weakest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them, listen, by, what is this word? Families. And I equipped them with swords and spears and bows. So more strategizing, more planning, more effort. He's like, the enemy thinks we're done. But we ain't done. Listen, you got fight left in you. The enemy is trying to convince you that certain areas of your life are over. It ain't over because the spirit of God lives in you. Amen? If he's calling you to something good, he wants you to, he wants you to move toward that until the day you stop breathing, period. End of discussion. Anybody ready for that fight? Well, you, you need to be. I'm not convinced that this 1045 serves. I'm not sure what's going on out there. But listen, this is, this is the most important part right here. This is the landing right here. Verse 14, this is so incredible. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of all the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the, come on, say this word. The Lord. Remember the Lord who is great, who is awesome, and fight for your families, for your sons and for your daughters and for your wives and for your homes. He, he's like, I, I know it doesn't look good, but I want you to remember something. I want you to remember the, and I, and I want you, the who? Lord. I, and I want you to remember that he is great and he is awesome. He goes, I want you, even though it seems like everything is going south in your life, I want you to remember the Lord. And here's what I want you to remember about him, that he is great 
And he is awesome. Pause real quick. If you, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what issue or situation or enemy is attacking you right now, if you just stopped and remembered every day that the battle is the Lord's and the Lord, listen, he is great and he is awesome. Do you think that would make that fight easier? Yeah, Yeah, I think so. I really do. And so he's like, we don't fight against flesh and blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. You just got to give it to him. You got to put him into the mix, right? And Jesus says, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, I'm in the mix. I don't care what his plans are. I got my own plans. Amen? And so Nehemiah says this, and this is the principle. You may want to write this down. Are you ready for this? So he says, fight for your stupid family. I added that part. Listen, fight for your family. Fight for your family. Now, pause. I at least expected some men in this house to go, yeah, let me try this again. So Nehemiah says, fight for your family. Fight for your wives. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your children. You fight for them. You stand up for what God wants to do in your life. Don't let the world just push you over. Amen? Are you hearing me? Fight for your kids. When when your son is falling into the wrong crowd, you reach into the middle of that crowd and yank him out. You fight for him. When your daughter is being pulled into an ideology that would destroy everything that God has created in her, you fight for her. You get into the middle of that. You don't just go, oh, I feel for you, honey, and you're gonna be fine. Just do whatever you want. I just love you. I'm over here making you brownies all day long. It's gonna be great. No, you fight, amen? You fight against what is coming against your husband, your wife, your parents, your children. Your family matters, amen? We need to fight for better. Uh, The the last verse I want to read from Nehemiah is 15. It says this, uh, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each one to their own work. See, when we get God in, God begins to do a work that we cannot do. He does for me what I cannot do for myself. I need to be humble and remember that he is great and he is awesome. And I need to move toward him. I want you to think about what was going on here. It says that each returned to their own work. So what were they doing? They were building a, a, a city to build a nation, to build this community called the people of Israel. But in order to build a nation and a city and a people, they were told they had to fight for their, come on, their family. We don't just fight for the flag. We fight for our family. Because if our family is strong, we can build a city. We can build a nation. We can build a people. If our family is strong. You see this in there? Yes? Now listen to me, friends. Uh, Your family may not be perfect now. There might be a lot of brokenness. But from this day forward, you pick up those pieces, you make the changes, you strategize, you plan, and you fight. You fight for your family. You don't give up, amen? Now, doggone it, I'm about out of time. This three-service thing is killing me. Okay. (laughs) Now listen, 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 listen. I I, want to read, I I wanted to read a parable from Jesus. I'm just going to tell you the parable. Is that cool? Okay, so Jesus told these stories that we call parables because they were earthly stories with heavenly meaning. They were earthly stories that carried the weight of eternity with them. And one of his most famous parables is the one about the the prodigal son. Have you ever heard it? So the son goes to his dad and he says, Dad, you're rich. I want my share of the inheritance now. And the dad's like, I'm not even dead. And, and And the kid goes, I don't care. I want it. I demand it. So the father gives it to his son and the son goes out and he blows it on foolish uh, living, foolish women and drugs and alcohol and all this stuff and just ruins his life. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? And then eventually the son comes back and he says, dad, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? And the dad forgives. Amen? Amen. Well, there's a part of this parable that's often overlooked and it's, it's the role of the father who is the image of God in this. Did you know that in that parable, Jesus says, and the father every day would go to the edge of the field, edge of his property, and he would look for his son, welcoming him home. Welcoming him home. Now look at me. In this room, I I realize that there are a whole bunch of families that have so much brokenness, so many hurtful things, 
so many disappointments. And you feel like it's just too late. I don't pretend to, to, to be able to say anything that could fix anything. But I think that God gives us a picture that sometimes we need to be willing to forgive and other times we need to be willing to ask for forgiveness. But we, we need to be like that father. Parents, like I talk to parents all the time who's, I mean, who tell me like, I raised my kid in the church. They even loved Jesus. They, they went to city kids all their life. They went to the youth groups and they were doing great until they went to college and then they're crazy and they've gotten into all things LGBT or all things drugs or all things alcohol or just, you know, pornography and they're, they're just, their, their life is in shambles. They've dropped out of school and they're, they're doing nothing. You hear this stuff, right? And they go, I don't know how it got here. And friends, I don't know how it got here and I'm not even sure how to fix it. Uh, I, I was talking to some of my dearest friends uh, this last week. My wife and I went out to lunch with them and, and, and they were telling us how, uh, and they're the coolest people, they're fun and they're, they're just godly people and they raised three beautiful kids and, and one of their sons um, who, who was raised in the church, played worship music, uh, very involved with everything. Um, when he became about 30 years old, he fell in love with a, a Muslim girl. And they said it was like almost overnight, he just abandoned his faith, turned from God, turned from Jesus, and read, ran headlong into Islam. And it's just, obviously it's caused a ton of tension in their life and a ton of pain and hurt. They don't understand it. And so I reached out to them again this week and I said, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you just tell me a little bit about what you learned in this whole process of just trying to deal with a wayward son? And uh, I just want to read some of their uh, thoughts because I'm just going to quote them to you because they're just so good. It's right here. Uh, this is what they wrote, almost word for word. It says, here's what I would recommend. Here's what we've learned. Truly believe that God still has a perfect plan for your family and for your kid's life. Don't lose hope. Love them unconditionally. Don't compromise, but love them in all things. Amen? Amen. Don't compromise, but love them in all things. Always pray. She says, the mom says, continue to live fully for Jesus in front of them, but don't preach at them, but be the ex best example of Christ you could ever be. Whew. They, they went on to say this. Um, they, they went on to say, my son has already heard all of this from us but we pray that God would bring the right people into his life to speak truth in his heart because he probably is never gonna hear it from us. But we pray that his heart will not grow cold or hard, they said. It would not grow hard, but God would bring people to soften him. They ended up with these words. The wife says, remember the story of the prodigal son? We just talked about it. She says, um, the father, he didn't chase down his son. He didn't make demands of his son. But he was always looking for his son's return. He never gave up hope. Then they wrote, let the Holy Spirit do a work in your kid that you cannot do. Um, friends, uh, all I know is that we don't win our family back by compromise. We win our family back by love, unconditional love, by sacrifice, by always hope, by always being full of hope, by praying for them nonstop. I, I, I was listening to another mom tell her story. Uh, her kid ran away when she was 15 years old. The kid ran away, didn't see their kid for seven years. Could you imagine that, parent? Seven years, ran away from home. They said when the, they never left their porch light on, they were a family that turned off their lights. They said, but the day the kid left, they started going to the, to the porch light at dusk every night and they'd flip the light on, hoping it would be a sign to their daughter that she was welcomed home at any time. And, and they said later, seven years later, the daughter eventually walked through their doors. And the daughter said, I would drive down your street and I would park at the end of the street and I would watch for that light to flick on. And I knew it was for me. I knew it was my way home. It just took me seven years to walk through those doors. <laughs> 